Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm delighted to be able to attend uh, this conference and to meet uh, so many uh, leaders in the field of cornea and other. It's uh, almost humbling to give a lecture on ocular surface disease and ocular surface reconstruction when so many uh, luminaries who have made many of the seminal contributions uh, to the field are in the room, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Um, uh, so I, I do have some disclosures. Some of them are related to developing novel biomaterials uh, for ocular surface repair, and we have some funding from the government to help with that. In the past, when the cornea was, was diseased, we replaced the entire cornea. Um, now we think that if one part of the cornea is diseased, well, let's just repair that particular part. So the idea of selective surgery is important. And of course, we do selective stromal surgery with lamellar keratoplasty and endothelial keratoplasty. But in this case, we're going to talk about selective corneal interventions of the epithelium uh, related to limbal stem cell grafts, stem cell expansion, and using different sorts of biomaterials for this. So what is tissue engineering? Well, it's the use of a combination of cells, engineering and materials methods, along with suitable biochemical and physiochemical factors to improve or replace biological function. So we'll hit on a lot of these areas within tissue engineering. I'll specifically talk a little bit about the work that we're doing to develop new materials for ocular surface reconstruction. So stem cells, of course, are defined as cells which have the potential to regenerate a tissue over a lifetime. And of course, stem cells come in various potencies. So the stem cells we tend to work with on the ocular surface are adult stem cells. Um, your, your typical limbal epithelial stem cell isn't going to become a liver or a heart or a kidney, although maybe we could force it to do so using molecular methods. Uh, so we have oligopotent stem cells. Of course, there are other kinds of stem cells which are more totipotent, like embryonic stem cells. And those also have been uh, proposed to be used for ocular surface uh, indication. So we think the corneal stem cells live in the limbus, although in mice there seems to be uh, maybe a, a more um, promiscuous distribution of stem cells. Um, and we know that there are stem cells in the limbus because we transplant limbus, we can functionally restore the stem cell compartment of the eye. But bona fide genetic or biochemical markers for limbal stem cells really have remained quite elusive. Um, you can look at an alphabet soup of things which have been proposed to be stem cell markers for the corneal epithelium, and none of them actually are, are strict stem cell markers. So of course, you know, we see these chemical injuries, and in the past, conjunctival limbal autographs or allografts have been used and were really the state of the art for some time. Um, Ken Kenyon and others developed these, and we transplant large pieces of tissues, essentially using the native structure as the engineered ocular surface. I just attended a, a very interesting set of lectures on SLET, um, simple limbal epithelial transplantation. In a way, this is like this carolimbal allograft using native um, compartments and native uh, niches uh, to transplant the epithelium. It seems like it could perhaps be some benefit in that. Um, allografts uh, are not as successful as autographs when uh, doing keralimbal grafts, given the need to immunosuppress. Um, and thus, the idea of cultivating stem cells from a variety of sources, whether they're corneal source, taking small um, um, biopsies of limbus, or even oral sources or others, um, have been proposed, and, and initially by um, Psy, New England Journal, and Nishida, New England Journal. Um, but sources of stem cells have been looked at, either reprogramming skin stem cells, which is something that we're doing in my laboratory or trying to do in my laboratory, Teru Nishida and others published in Nature recently um, using IPS cells to be reprogrammed, and embryonic stem cells have been proposed uh, as well. But the one thing I like to focus on is the carriers. How do we move the stem cells from the dish, or even when we're doing uh, SLET procedures, how do we um, provide them with a suitable substrate on which to grow and thrive? Native tissue is certainly used, and this is SLET, and also the carolimbal grafts, but the amniotic membrane, of course, fibrin sealants have been used. Um, freeze sheets and, of course, new biomaterials. So amniotic membrane has long been used, either freeze-dried but more often cryopreserved, to support epithelial migration and may also have some immunosuppressive properties. Um, the clinical outcomes, um, Paolo Rama and his colleagues in the New England Journal showed in 2010 that these lim cultivated limbal epithelial transplants can be quite successful. And once they take, they tend to be more f relatively permanent. Uh, they tried to um, perhaps uh, look for better graphs by looking for one marker of uh, stemness in cells, P63, um, and found that the more P63 expression, the better their graphs did. Other groups are looking at other markers to try to engineer tissues that are more likely to be successful. Of course, their clinical outcomes, like the clinical outcomes um, in India, are outstanding when these, when these graphs uh, work. 
Uh, we're actually developing new engineered biomaterials which might make um, amniotic membrane less used and, and provide something else. So what would be an ideal material for surface reconstruction? It should be transparent. It should support the growth of epithelium. It should persist for just the right amount of time. Of course, it needs to be biocompatible, preferably anti-inflammatory. It should be easy to use surgically and it shouldn't be able to transmit infections. Amniotic membrane isn't always uh, perfectly transparent, as you might know. Um, it can persist in uninflamed eyes for months. Um, and though we've turned to a different source of a biomaterial, we've looked at silk worms uh, who make these lo lovely silk cocoons. Uh, they make the silk in my tie. But if you extract the silk from the tie, turn it from a fiber into a liquid form, you can, uh, using relatively simple biochemistry, you can create very thin, highly transparent, highly strong films. Here's a couple of those films. And they have very good mechanical properties. You know, silk strands are very, very strong. Um, they're optically very clear, at least as clear as a piece of cornea. And the inherent mechanical characteristics and material characteristics, they're biocompatible. You can tune them. It tends to be very useful for um, extracellular ma matrix remodeling. So we can make these films from the nanoscale to the microscale, various thicknesses. Um, we looked at comparing amniotic membrane uh, to these films. The, the films on the lower panel are much easier to handle than a piece of amniotic membrane. Epithelial cells like to grow on the silk films. Here's some light and electron microscopy. And they proliferate very well on these films as well. If you look for stem cell and differentiation markers, basically essentially indistinguishable um, from, um, from amniotic membrane. And you can get them to stratify, just as you can get cells to stratify on silk films, you can, on, on uh, amniotic membrane, you can get cells to stratify on, on silk films as well. We decided to modify these silk films to make them better than amniotic membrane. We just don't want a replacement. So we're using nanotopography. So to create small um, topographies on the surface, much like you might find in native tissue that helps guide genes expression and change the behavior of cells. We use a process called soft lithography to take nanoscale features from a silicone wafer transfer that to a silicone uh, model and then make these films. Here's some example of very thin silk films with various types of patterns. The cells will grow well upon these patterns, actually elongate along the ridges to change their shape. We show that the cytoskeleton, so the actin filaments that create the structure of the cells, as well as the, um, the, the, where the focal adhesions happen, are redistributed by growing upon these films. We can make the cells stick and also orient um, in, a, in a fashion of our predetermined nature. So the cables of the cell and the cytoskeleton are much stronger, and they tend to adhere better to these films than they do to native cornea. So in certain conditions, of course, you want the cells to stick and not create um, epithelial defects. We notice that the cells actually dig into these grooves to hold on like talons and that they're able to stick better. We're also able to control the way cells move. So cells, instead of randomly moving to heal, we can direct them using these patterns so they find a more direct route to the center of the cornea as they're, um, as they're healing. We've shown that the collectively the, cell, the, um, the silk films will cause little fingers of epithelial cells to grow out in, in vitro, and that these uh, fingers then stick more strongly. Um, in addition to just controlling how cells move, we've seen that gene expression um, using uh, next-gen sequencing changes when we grow cells on silk films. Um, and actually, more importantly, they change even more growing on, on the pattern films than they do just on the silk films alone. And of course, this increases the actin cytoskeleton, increases integrin signaling, increases focal adhesions and fax signaling. We've begun to place these cells in vivo. Um, and see that the cells are also guided when we implant um, amniotic me uh, these, um, these silk films in lieu of amniotic membrane for um, allowing healing of epithelial defects in animal models. In uh, addition, we also have the capability to genetically modify cells, another form of uh, engineering, which is genetic engineering. You know, we can make transgenic mice that glow in the dark. We also know that many of our corneal diseases are genetic in origin. Even those that aren't genetic, we now understand the molecular underpinnings of much of corneal disease. What causes blood vessels to grow? What causes immunopathology? What causes rejection? So if we can uh, make cells that then express particular genes, we can then control biology and perhaps make these um, transplants more successful particularly in the co context of inhospitable milieu. So the, the many of the diseases we see are acute and then there's healing, but in dis chronic diseases like Stevens-Johnson or ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, we need other genes that perhaps will suppress inflammation and make stem cell transplants uh, better. So again, we could um, uh, tr genetically modify anti-angiogenic, anti-inflammatory, or stem-like genes. We've shown that using new generations of viral vectors, we can ex vivo transplant new genes, in this case, green fluorescent protein, into cultivated epithelial cells. We can get the um, cells to express the genes indefinitely, at least uh, up to a month and longer. 
We know that using higher doses, we can get even higher expression of the genes within these cells. We've also shown using side population analysis that we don't just infect regular cells in the epithelium. We actually get the cells, the, the new genes into stem cells, which mean that there can be prolonged expression using these viral vectors um, in these cultivated transplants. We've also shown that we can create epithelial sheets that are genetically modified. And these genetically modified cell sheets um, stratify just as normal epithelial cells. And finally, We've shown in an in vitro study in rabbits that we can exp overexpress anti-angiogenic molecules. I don't have time to go through all the data, but by overexpressing soluble VEGF uh, receptors, we're able to bind exogenous VEGF and uh, ultimately decrease neovascularization um, in models of angiogenesis, both in vitro um, and in vivo. Uh, so in short, it's an exciting time. Um, in uh, ocular surface reconstruction, but I think um, our engineering colleagues, uh, those who work in biomaterials and those who work in genetic engineering also provide us with opportunities not just to recapitulate the ocular surface that we might normally be able to get using stem cells, but to enhance these, stem cell, these constructs uh, made from stem cells to behave even better and to fight diseases which currently are very difficult and, um, and very uh, vexing uh, to, to treat. So I appreciate this. These are some of the folks who worked on the projects as well as the funding uh, that helped uh, make it happen as well. So thank you very much.